finance gets weaponized in war, and if China and the US ever get into any kind of conflict, then like, you can be sure that China will weaponize its gold. And that is the point at which you will be very glad you have the gold that you have. Welcome to the Gold Exchange Podcast, where we untangle market and policy complexity using timeless economic principles. For show notes and archives, go to goldexchangepodcast.com. Now, on to today's episode. Welcome back to the Gold Exchange Podcast. My name is Benjamin Vern Nadelstein. I'm joined by the funniest comedian on the planet, if I do say so myself, and the author of The Flying Frisbee, Dominic Frisbee. Dominic, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thank you. How's it going? Doing great. Dominic, we are in one of the craziest market environments I've probably ever seen in my entire life. What do you make of it? Most people said 5% interest rates, the economy would be like a parking lot, just completely flattened, and yet here we are. Market's doing okay, unemployment pretty low, inflation kind of you know, trending downwards. Things seem all right. Yeah, at the moment, th- there's a bit of a lag with interest rates, so you don't really know how much damage has been done until about six or nine months later. But it seems to be surviving. Um, in the UK, I think real estate is starting to look really dodgy. Um, US real estate seems to be quite location specific. I follow the market in Palm Springs in California quite closely because I have family who live there and that seems to be surviving. But I guess people who move to Palm Springs are already quite capital rich. They don't have to borrow that much. But in areas where the margins, yeah, there are bigger margins. So real estate's got problems. The bond market obviously has got problems. But yeah, it seems to be just about surviving. Everyone's talking about the recession, but it seems to just stay in the positive. Um, I have to say... Gold is looking pretty good at the moment. It's it's flirting with two thousand dollars. It doesn't. It, it went from eighteen hundred to two thousand in about four or five days. That was a rocket of a move, and it was very overbought. And you would have expected it to pull back, and it came back fifty dollars, but only momentarily. And now it's back up there. And um, I think gold's looking good. There's a a, a trader called Peter Brand, who's um, a real veteran trader, and he trades using patterns pattern recognition he calls it and if bank balances are anything to go by he's a very very clever man and he described um, the gold chart the monthly gold chart which has displayed a bullish engulfing pattern whatever that is but he he said it's one of the most bullish charts he's seen in his 48 years of investing and trading a lot of people have been talking about this cup and handle but you know once gold can get a into new highs then it's all clear and I think it's looking really good uh, we could see it as soon as next year because when, when it moves it, it just goes on like a six month tear away and I think gold could easily go to two and a half thousand two thousand seven hundred by this time next year so I'm very bullish about gold and you know I, I'm quite cynical about gold at times but at the moment I think it looks pretty good well and and I think the fact that gold is staying so high in price despite headwinds most people say gold has no income. Obviously, we pay income at monetary metals, but most people say, eh, opportunity cost 5% on a, a treasury bill. I'd rather do that. Why would I buy a shiny pet rock? They think, eh, you know, stocks are doing really well. I can, I can get into stocks. But surprisingly, gold has held up well. How much do you think of that has to do with central bank gold buying and the fact that we're seeing more and more conflicts pop up as more and more debt is issued? Do you think most people are looking around and saying, now's probably a good time to buy gold? There's no doubt that central banks are buying a lot of physical gold. And most of the central banks that are buying that physical gold are situated along the Silk Road. Uh, They're part of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, basically massive trading block in Asia. All the stands are buying loads of gold, China obviously as well. But I don't think that sets the price. I think the price is set in the paper markets in the US, in North America mostly. Um, I think the actual spot price in Shanghai is above the spot the actual recognized spot price in the US it's higher which is unusual Um, but yes so I think the price is set in the paper markets and you know there's a concern for the US dollar real rates are higher than actual rates even um, so on there's a lot of divergences happening between gold and certain uh, treasuries where normally they rise and fall together. Um, So yeah, I think 
the price is set in the paper markets and at the moment in the paper markets there's an appetite for gold the reasons are obvious I think there's three potential futures for gold and you know it's an analog asset in a digital age and all the value in the world at the moment is digital whether it's digital money 99 percent of money's digital the bond market the stock markets everything's digital the the digital economy grows at three times the rate of the physical economy and in all of this gold is the most analog asset there is in a digital world and if you think you go into a shop and you buy something in the shop and you use your credit card and it talks to the credit card machine, it talks to the shop, everything's just millions and millions of promises sent between parties that trust each other. And gold is the one asset in the world, maybe Bitcoin, that doesn't involve trust. Its, a, its value is in itself. It's a bearer asset. <coughs> Excuse me, but there are three potential futures for gold. One... Is it, you know, perhaps it is to finance as the horse was to transport. It's irrelevant now that we've invented the, the motor car or whatever. But there's, to keep coming back to this thing, one possibility is that gold is just, goes back to just being jewellery. I say goes back, but that's not quite right, but it's just jewellery. And it gradually reverts to that. It's never going to go to nothing, but its value is as is, is, is something attractive. The second possibility is that it's the money of last resort, so its only role is jewellery and insurance. And then the third possibility is that it actually goes back to having some kind of monetary function. Now, it's, in my view, it's never going to be a currency. It hasn't been a currency for ages. We never really used gold as currency. We used silver and uh, nickel and copper. Um, but, but it could still be money, you know, there's other forms of money. It's a, it, it's a medium of exchange, um, uh, a store of value, and a um, you know unit account. of account, and, and, a, and a standard of deferred payment. Um, but the reason I think gold, there's a chance that it goes back to number three, is the extraordinary amounts of gold that China has accumulated. And China, I've done a lot of work on this, has accumulated, uh, Chinese gold holdings, in my view, are maybe 10 times what they say they are. At the moment, America has 8,000 tons, China has 2,000 tons. I think China, if you look at um, Chinese gold imports, we don't know total Chinese gold imports because what goes through Dubai, Switzerland, London is private. But we do know that a lot of gold that goes into China goes through the Shanghai Gold Exchange, and we know that 22,000 tons of gold have been withdrawn from the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Remember, China says it has 2,000, and we know that 22,000 has been in, um, taken out there, plus everything that is private. We also know that China has mined 7,000 tons of gold from geological records, and China um, is the world's biggest gold miner as well as being the world's biggest gold importer. So 22,000 and 7,000, that brings us to 29,000, plus the 4,000 tonnes of gold that were already in China in the year um, 2000, some privately held, some held by the central bank. That brings us to a total figure of at least 33,000 tonnes of gold. China doesn't export any of the gold that it mines. It's not allowed to. It has to keep it. So we know that 33,000 tonnes of gold is in China, Let's just say half of that is state-owned. It's probably higher, but let's just say half of that is state-owned. Then you're looking at 16, 17,000 tons of gold, state-owned gold in China. It says it's got 2,000, really it's got 17,000. America has 8,000. So China probably has twice as much gold as the US. Now, it's not going to say I've, we've got twice as much gold to the US because that would, that would be a declaration of war but it has that card to play if it needs to at some stage. If it ever gets into a conflict to the US, the first thing that happens in conflict is the weaponization of finance. It's not known about this, but you know, weaponization of finance happened in World War II. Uh, the, the Nazis were shut out of the financial system. They resorted to using gold. But actually, for example, the Nazis printed loads of fake English currency and they were gonna drop it in the UK 
but they couldn't because they didn't have the air fleet to do it. This was 1943, so that it never actually got dropped in the UK, but the money was used on the continent in, in, in Europe. Finance gets weaponized in war, and if China and the US ever get into any kind of conflict, then I, you can be sure that China will weaponize its gold. And that is the point at which you will be very glad you have the gold that you have. And I do think there is a scenario where a country like Brazil, Russia, India, we've seen trade now between Russia and India, and Russia says we don't want rupees because rupees are a useless currency. So I could see a possibility where instead of settling trade imbalances in a currency, which nobody trusts or wants, that these countries say, let's settle in gold. And that's where these big players say, hey, we're going to start settling in gold. We're not going to have it in the United States or stored in a Brinks in Zurich. It's going to be in a Shanghai Gold Exchange or in a Dubai, in a country where we feel more comfortable, where we're not going to get locked out of. Yeah, the problem with that is they're looking at it. You know they're looking at it because they're the guys who are all buying it. But the problem is none of those countries trust each other. And, you know, for a long time, the world has trusted the US dollar and the banking system. And so, and you know, every time a trade is effective, they're not going to stick some gold on a plane and fly it over. So the practicalities of who stores it, how much can they be trusted, that hasn't been sorted yet. The way to fix that is for China to declare its gold holdings and then say that the yuan is freely redeemable with gold. And not everyone would re necessarily redeem their, their yuan for gold. It's just they need to demonstrate that it could be redeemable. And when people know that they could redeem it if they wanted to, that's a, the point at which you win international trust. I think we're a good few years away from that, but the, it's a possibility in the future. Let's talk about the other alternative currency here, which is a Bitcoin, which is a crypto of some sort, whether gold or, or others. How do you see that happening? Because we, we've, we've had a lot of speculation, hey, Bitcoin is going to be the new medium of exchange, store of value currency. It's changed kind of the narrative a lot. There was this big kind of depreciation from all time highs. Do you think that the, the kind of air has, has fallen out of the crypto bubble, that the shine is off? Or do you think there's still some applications here that we're missing? Oh, Bitcoin. The, the, the possibilities with Bitcoin are just extraordinary. And to me, the risk is not owning Bitcoin. It's, sorry, the risk is not owning Bitcoin. It's not owning Bitcoin. Because the potential of the thing is so extraordinarily large. You know, the US dollar as a currency is limited by national borders and limited by the banking system. It's impossible for, you know, some dude in Africa. It's even hard enough for me to get a US dollar account in the UK. It's just hard problematic. Anyone can just download an app on their phone and start trading in Bitcoin. So there's just a scale and it's also it's borderless. There's a scalability to Bitcoin that it, even from today's prices is extraordinary. And it would solve the problems that the Shanghai Go that the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization is having. I don't think they'll start using Bitcoin, but but there's a possibility that they could. Heck, China mines enough of this stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think Bitcoin's potential is, is just too big to ignore. I know Keith's not the biggest fan. He's always moaning, he's slagging it off on Twitter and stuff, but he's wrong. Love it. And that's why we like to have other voices on the show. Dominic, let's uh, finish here with two questions. First, what are some indicators that you're looking at? Who are some voices that you're listening to to stay abreast of the markets and say, hey, when I listen to this person, I know what's going on. Or when I look at this indicator, I can see something's up. I don't know. I don't listen to people anymore. I've stopped. I used to listen. I listened to Michael Saylor on Bitcoin because he's just so extraordinarily articulate about it. But on gold, I like Druckenmiller. I like Druckenmiller too. When I listen to an interview with Druckenmiller, I, I, I try not to listen to the permabulls because they're permabulls and gold doesn't only go up. Right. And I'm a big believer in moving averages. They tell a, a story. The short-term story is told by the short-term moving averages and the mid and long-term story is told by the long, where are they going? Um, so I listen to moving averages and gut. The Dominic Frisbee gut, that's who we should listen to. Okay, and then final question here. What's a question we should be asking all future guests of the Gold Exchange podcast? Um, 
is gold to money as the horse was to transport? Dominic Frisbee, I love it. Thank you so much for joining the Gold Exchange podcast. Where can people find more of your work? Um, the flyingfrisbee.com or flyingfrisbee.com, either of those will take you there. And that's my newsletter. And um, there's a free version and a paid version. And you will get extraordinary insights, the like of which you will not read anywhere else. Dominic Frisbee, thank you so much. We'd love to see you again. This episode was brought to you by Monetary Metals. Monetary Metals is a different kind of gold company. Others buy and sell gold. Monetary Metals operates the Gold Yield Marketplace, a platform of products that offer a yield on gold paid in gold to investors and institutions, and are gold financing simplified, reliable financing denominated in gold with a built-in hedge for gold using and gold producing businesses. To learn more, visit www.monetary-metals.com. See you next time.